Hello, Kin332. My name is Rob Brantley. I'm a kinesiology major at Cal Baptist University. Thank you guys for joining me today for my presentation on the walking gait development through the lifespan. Just a quick background on the walking gait cycle. Typically what you look for is the initial contact of the foot starting at the heel, uh, going through a single supported or unilateral stance phase. Uh, landing in a double supported fa phase and then starting your swing phase and then concluding back at the initial contact of the heel. In its early stages during early childhood, development of the walking gait is brand new for these beginner walkers. Uh, they are just transitioning from moving around on four limbs in a crawling fashion to being able to balance in, uh, on their hind legs in a new upright posture. Neurologically, this is a new stimulus for their bodies. Uh, the synapses between neurons uh, need to begin uh, signaling uh, to the brain this new uh, stimulus and to help increase the amount of proprioception and to help increase the amount of muscular strength needed for stability and the coordination for the walking gait to occur. Uh, theories and principles during this development. Um, as we discussed earlier, beginner walkers first need to have enough strength to uh, maintain an upright posture. Uh, this means the muscles in their core, in their trunk, in their extensor muscles need to strengthen. Uh, this strength also needs to be able to support them in a unilateral or one leg stance and have they must have enough balance to be able to adjust to the different weight shifts when they're alternating uh, from one leg to the next uh, in each gait cycle. In early childhood, uh, the gait abnormalities you typically see are a wide base of support. Uh, this is to add stability, um, which often comes with a reduction in mobility. So typically what you see in this wide base of support with their feet toed out is their steps are typically a lot shorter with very little uh, hip or knee extension. Um, their arms, you can see, are commonly held at a high guard position, uh, in, almost in a ready position to help catch them if they fall, and also to aid in the stability and balance. This high guard position um, pretty much eliminates any chance of having uh, oppositional movement of the arms to assist in trunk rotation or proper arm swings to occur. Uh, each step you can typically or you can see uh, look individual of themselves. There really isn't much of a flow or a cycle to each step. Um, as you can see here in this example, this is my son Bryson uh, in some of his early uh, childhood development of his walking gait, walking with that wide base of support, his feet toed out, and his hands are held in that high guard position. Uh, common constraints uh, during early childhood development of the walking gait. Um, again, they can be physically constrained uh, with a lack of strength and balance needed for their proper gait sequence. Uh, perceptually, uh, this can be perceptually constraining because they're used to ha having four points of support or four limbs of support in locomotion and then they have to adjust to being on just two with their hind legs. Um, this is also uh, going to adjust things like their depth perception, which can also be perceptionally constrained. Uh, moving on to the childhood development of the walking gait sequence here, uh, as the children gain experience in walking, uh, their base of support begins to get narrower and their feet tend to get a little bit straighter. Uh, this comes as physical strength, stability, and balance increase. Um, eventually, they can work their way to having their feet or their base of support within the trunk of their body. Uh, their arms, as they gain experience um, and trust and balance, will work from that high guard position uh, eventually to a low guard position and then um, into an arm swing, which um, the development of the arm swing will help aid in that oppositional movement to allow uh, better hip extension and trunk rotation to occur, uh, which it, um, again assists in better stride length and uh, better gait sequence to occur. Um, 
as they gain experience, their coordination, their proprioception, and those um, and those uh, synapses between neurons begin to strengthen. Uh, this will help them improve their hip and knee flexion uh, during the unilateral stance phases of the stride. Um, and as they gain experience, their rhythm and cadence uh, of each stride during the gait cycle will improve as well. Theories and principles during this stage of development. Uh, during the childhood stage of development, uh, many of the key gait patterns uh, for experienced walkers or advanced walkers uh, tend to be achieved during this phase of development. Um, it's typically around the ages of two to four um, and noticeable changes can be seen throughout this phase all the way up until about the age of five, uh, specifically with the rhythm and coordination. After the age of five, there are improvements in development, but they're not as noticeable as they are during the childhood stage of development. Uh, common gait abnormalities uh, during uh, the childhood stage of development. Uh, you can see a lot of tippy toe walkers uh, in the, in the gait sequence. Um, this is typically caused by uh, immature locomotion programming and uh, is typically fixed uh, over time, it can fix itself uh, as experience is gained. Um, if it does persist, then uh, uh, interventions of teaching the proper gait sequence um, are, are typically prescribed. Here's another example of this abnormality of tippy toed walking. This is my daughter Layla at three years old. You can see she's got a narrower base of support as she's gained experience in her arm swing, but the, the tippy toe walking was pretty persistent at this point in her life. She's now uh, four and a half years old and the tippy toe walking has subsided and has a normal gait sequence now. Uh, typical constraints uh, during this developmental stage, um, neurologically, uh, their proprioception and coordination have improved and have gotten a lot better and um, allows them or affords them a better base of support uh, throughout their walking gait and uh, better stability during their stance phase. Uh, physical constraints, they are now much stronger, uh, which also uh, permits a, a lot better uh, balance during their stance phases and uh, better push off or propulsion from the, um, from the terminal stance phase. The constantly changing uh, physical developments that they see during this childhood stage, uh, such as things like growth spurts, um, can be perceptually constraining uh, as they try and scale their body to the environment around them. Uh, things like growing feet and how they interact with the ground. Uh, my son Bryson, who is uh, two years old right now is has gone through a pretty a pretty big growth spurt. Um, uh, trips over his feet all the time, and um, they also uh, with this growth spurt, you can see they grow to new heights. And uh, this is a perceptual constraint for them and their depth perception uh, with things around the environment. Um, for example, like both my kids, as they grow, like they think they can fit underneath a table or a countertop as they're running around and all of a sudden you know they they smoke a corner of a table or something with their head uh, because they can't fit underneath it anymore uh, moving on to the um, development of gait of the walking gait sequence through adulthood um, typically by this time uh, the walkers are much more advanced and experienced this is definitely the most efficient stage of the walking development um, at this stage, adult walkers are able to really optimize this gait sequence, and this helps to conserve energies um, when traveling from you know, point A to point B. Um, they are able to remain in a single leg or a unilateral supported stance a lot longer than earlier stages of walking. Uh, this allows for greater hip extension and a better toe-off um, uh, phase to occur uh, to propel them and, and to put them in a good position for the initial contact of the heel on the contralateral leg. 
uh, theories and principles during this stage of development. Again, uh, uh, entering adulthood, um, this is you know the 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 peak of the individual's development. Um, this is uh, especially so for uh, active individuals, uh, and they're able to actually maintain proper walking gait, uh, a proper walking gait longer than sedentary individuals. Um, because at adulthood, it is common for sedentary individuals to add on things like excess weight, um, which can, again, leave them more susceptible to uh, different illnesses or, um, you know, if the weight gets too much, it can physically um, be a constraint in their walking gait. Uh, this um, here is, a, is an example of a uh, it's, it's me, an adult, uh, being able to perform an adequate walking gait sequence, helping perform tasks like watching my daughter cross the street safely. Um, common abnormalities during this development. Um, a lot of times uh, people can develop, especially in my case, <coughs> excuse me, Muscular asymmetries um, that over time, these poor movement patterns and repetition can cause walking gait abnormalities like hip, like poor hip extension in the propulsion phase. <coughs> uh, for me, this uh, was caused because of um, uh, because of what I do on my job. I'm a catcher, a uh, baseball player, which you commonly sit in a squatted position for a long time, which has uh, caused me to develop a quad dominance uh, muscle asymmetry in my lower body, which has created an anterior pelvic tilt, uh, which gives me poor hip extension and um, prohibits me from uh, consistently reaching uh, initial contact at the heel. Um, which is something that uh, needs to be worked on with the uh, antagonist or opposite side, the posterior side of my body, the hamstrings and the glute muscles to get better recruitment for a better walking gait. Um, constraints that you can see during this adulthood stage of development. Um, active adults at this stage, they have uh, their, their faculties are at their peak levels of strength and stability, uh, balance and rhythm uh, for adequate walking gait and to be able to conserve as much energy uh, in each gait cycle. Uh, sedentary individuals during this stage um, can uh, encounter physical constraints, um, especially with things like excess weight gain and um, can prohibit them from being able to have an adequate walking gait. Entering into the older adulthood uh, developmental stages of the walking gait, uh, things that you can typically see is um, their stride length uh, tends to decrease and their toes and base of support tend to uh, get wider or toe out. Uh, the amount of ankle extension during the propulsion phase uh, tends to be reduced and the amount of pelvic rotation uh, in each stride tends to diminish. Um, theories and principles during this stage of development, uh, there is a natural decline in the body systems uh, that begins to occur in older adulthood. Uh, this causes a bit of regression in the walking gait. Uh, there is a loss of strength and balance from deteriorating muscle tissue caused by a decline in things like your testosterone levels as your uh, muscular system and endocrine system and your uh, nervous system all uh, begin its decline. A common abnormality seen during the stage of development, um, you can see things like an intelligent gait, which is a shortened stance phase or a limp. Uh, this is commonly caused by this degenerating tissue um, and things like arthritis. At this limp, you try to avoid pain by shortening that stance phase. Uh, I have an example video here that will show you exactly what that looks like. <laughs> 